Welcome back, everyone. My name is Lauren, and I'm a research intern at the Center for Community-Based Research. Welcome to webinar number five of Evaluating Refugee Programs, a workshop in evaluation capacity building. In webinar number one, we discussed what evaluation is, the basics of community-based evaluation, and why community-based evaluation is important for refugee programs. Webinar number two then discussed an introduction, <clears throat> excuse me, into phase one of conducting an evaluation, which is about laying the foundation. Webinar three introduced us into phase two, uh, which discussed community-based evaluation planning. In webinar four, we looked at phase three of conducting an evaluation, which is about gathering and analyzing information. Now we have reached our final webinar, webinar number five, which will look at phase four of conducting an evaluation, acting on findings. Again, we invite you to check out our project website, evalforrefugee.ca, as there are a number of additional resources, such as primer videos, outcomes inventory based on reports and literature in the refugee sector, and additional evaluation resources and online sites. The project is guided by a national advisory committee of practitioners, academics, networks, and people with lived refugee experience. In addition, we are in the process of developing a mentorship program. Uh, so we have a list of people that are interested and willing to mentor, coach, and work alongside refugee programs in evaluation, as well as a Canada-wide community of practice. Before we begin this section, let's just quickly review what evaluation is. Evaluation is an organized approach to collecting information about activities, impacts, and effectiveness that helps improve a program or organization and describe its accomplishments. So as we've mentioned in all of our previous webinars, we are advocating for a community-based evaluation model. The community-based evaluation approach involves active participation of stakeholders in all phases of evaluation. Stakeholders can include service providers, organizations, governments, service receivers, clients, or others. The goal is to improve and make positive changes to the program. In our webinars, we are looking at how this model can be used to provide results that are useful to those who need them the most. So there are four phases of community-based evaluation, which are one, laying the foundation, two, evaluation planning, three, information gathering and analysis, and four, acting on findings. So as mentioned earlier, we have gone through the three phases of community-based evaluation in our previous webinars. And then in this webinar, we're going to discuss the final phase, phase four, acting on findings. Uh, and we will discuss how we can act on findings through sharing our learnings and initiating new actions. When sharing evaluation learnings, the use or the usefulness of your evaluation needs to be at the top of your mind. You should always be thinking about how the findings can be communicated in a way that they can be used. The steering committee is a huge resource for determining use. The steering committee should agree on the strategies used. You need to think about what should be communicated to what stakeholders and in what ways. At this time, I invite you to pause the video and think about some of the ways you have shared your findings in the past. What are some of the mechanisms you've used to get your steering committee excited about the uptake of this information? In the next few slides, I'm going to share some of the different ways results can be communicated to a wider audience. A diversity of formats should be used to share evaluation learnings. 
You can see in this table some examples of written, visual, or oral strategies for sharing results. You're encouraged to use more than one strategy when deciding how to share results. So for example, you might do a report with a poster that you present at a conference. There are a multitude of ways to share findings and you are encouraged to be creative when sharing results. So we'll start off with this one example of how we shared findings. Um, and it was the Successful Families Program. This program was for teen parents who were encouraged to describe their experiences being a teenage parent. We tried multiple ways to encourage them to describe their experience, but we couldn't get the teenagers to attend. So for example, we actually tried um, encouraging them to come and bake with us um, and talk about their experience. It sounded fun and engaging, but when we hosted it, no one showed up. Finally, we decided on trying photo voice. We gave all the teenage parents a camera and told them to capture photos that reflect what's important to them as young parents. This had outstanding participation uh, rates. We then took those photos and turned it into an exhibit where participants and others were encouraged to come see. This actually garnered so much attention that we then replicated the exhibit at Edmonton City Hall. The turnout was unprecedented, even garnering media attention from CBC and CTV. This then caught the attention of the current MLA, Lori Sigurdsson, who developed an interest in the project and contacted the Terra Center to learn more. And this ended up influencing public policy. So this is an example of sharing findings that had an unprecedented reaction. We actually never had intentional plans to influence public policy when we set out, but we just kept running up against policy as the project unfolded. So examples of how we bumped into policy um, was we, we noticed the uh, shortage of affordable housing in general. Um, we also noticed the need for more supportive housing specifically. And then there were lots of stipulations around subsidies. So for example, children um, have to be in childcare a certain amount of days to remain eligible. So it was a snowball effect that had a wonderful outcome. This is another example of sharing findings. This was a project focusing on raising healthy young First Nations children. You can see an elder shared a metaphor of a child's development as similar to the growth and development of a flower. A student and artist that was work is working on the project painted the metaphor and we used the features of the plant to share our qualitative data from the community. We reprinted several copies of his painting and each community received one to hang in their school as well as the tribal college. These are other examples of sharing findings. The first is Youth Experience First Episode Psychosis that was done through interpretive dance. The second is a research-based theater in a project related to metastatic breast cancer. Both are creative takes on sharing information. Please pause the video and take some time to watch the Hearing Voices YouTube video or read the Handle with Care, Women Living with Metastatic Breast Cancer article, if you'd like. When sharing information, always have the audience in mind. You might have so many audiences, it is overwhelming, but try and find your target audience and how best to communicate to them. Think about the key messages you would share to each audience and the ways in which you would go about that. You may notice on the Building a Healthy Community report on the slide that they used a scale, tomato and bicycle as pie charts. They also used cigarettes as bar charts to illustrate smoking rates among youth. These details can make a report more engaging for the reader. So here are a couple more examples of sharing findings. In the Raised Between Cultures project, 
a video and a knowledge reflection guidebook were created for people who want to better understand the experiences of immigrant and refugee children and wishes to create intercultural spaces, particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, for folks who work in early learning and care. And Bureau Crazy features four mothers who are determined to improve their lives despite the bureaucratic obstacles they face as they attempt to meet basic needs, advance their education, secure employment, and care for their children. It is capturing women's experiences around navigating systems for their children. This was designed to inform policy and decision makers, service providers, students, and others interested in improving the provision of health and social services in Alberta. So here we have an application exercise to do. We are going to create a sharing plan. Please pause the video and take some time to answer the following questions and fill in the following table. So firstly, how will your group share learnings? And secondly, what type of formats would best communicate your evaluation findings? Could it be reports? presentations, video, theater? Who is the intended audiences for each product? So when you're ready, let's move on and do another exercise. As you've created your sharing plan, now I want you to think about what your dissemination strategies might be. Please pause the video in order to answer the following questions. So firstly, what specific activities will help you share findings so that key people are moved into action? And secondly, are there any natural decision-making events that you can utilize? So the last step is to initiate new action. The evaluation is not done until this step is done. This is the sort of baton passing step where the steering group and others in the organization take over the leadership of implementing the evaluation findings. You want to make sure what you've learned is used in making program changes. The steering committee provides recommendations and there is agreement among the committee that ensures usefulness and increases the potential for success. Check in with the committee to ensure that people follow up with their commitments and slowly build a culture of evaluation. So now we are going to do another important practical exercise, creating an action plan. Please pause the video and take the time to answer the following questions. So firstly, what are the potential steps that would be needed to start implementing the evaluation recommendations? How well are your steering committee and original partners positioned to do this? And are there perhaps new partners you might need to engage through your evaluation? And secondly, what further information might be needed to provide more detailed implementation steps? So we have now completed all four phases of community-based evaluation. In phase one, we discussed laying the foundation for our evaluation. This included mapping the stakeholders, creating a logic model, and creating a, a purpose statement. We then discussed phase two, evaluation planning. In this phase, we developed the main evaluation questions, chose our methods, and developed the data analysis plan. In phase three, information gathering and analysis, we gathered data and conducted the data analysis adhering to the ethical principles of evaluation. In phase four, which was today, we learned about acting on findings and created a sharing plan and an action plan. With the completion of this final webinar, you are now equipped to conduct your own evaluation.
Now, I invite you to think to yourself, how are you and or your organization going to conduct your own evaluation? So I think this is the last activity of all of our webinars. Taking what you've learned from all five of these webinars, I invite you to take time at the end of this webinar and develop your own program evaluation plan. So filling out this form will help you put together basic information you will need for developing your program evaluation plan. So feel free to pause this uh, video right now to work on this plan. And when you're ready, um, we're just gonna move on to the next slide now. So to continue learning about community-based evaluation or refreshing your knowledge about conducting community-based evaluation, please feel free to go to evalforrefugee.ca and access more resources on building evaluation capacity. On the website, you'll also be able to find further information about our mentorship program. And if you're interested in continuing to build evaluation capacity, the Evaluation Capacity Network offers coaching and mentoring. It also offers UEVAL, which is a one-week evaluation institute. Uh, and you can also participate in Eval Lab. You can access online resources, or you can join the Evaluation Capacity Network. And additional support is available at the Center for Community-Based Research, um, as listed on this slide. So this includes coaching and mentoring, partnering on an evaluation, proposal development, evaluation support, training, and webinars using the Community-Based Research Excellence Tool, customized training in community-based research and evaluation, and uh, we invite you for even more support to visit our website at communitybasedresearch.ca. So I do want to acknowledge that at the beginning of all of our webinars, we've been mentioning that we have a community of practice that's coming soon. So at the time of recording this webinar, uh, which is the very beginning of April, the activities for our community of practice haven't started yet. We do have a number of events and activities planned to be coming up soon though, and they're going to be announced via the community of practice. So we invite you to absolutely join our community of practice. Um, and if you do so, then that means you would be able to receive notice of the events and activities as they come up. Um, or perhaps if you're watching this webinar a few months down the road from when I'm recording it, it may be in full swing. So in order to join, I invite you to go to settlenet.org and search for our open group. And our group is called Equipping for Community-Based Evaluation. For more information, you can go to evalforrefugee.ca and our Community of Practice webpage is under the Learn More tab. So as we wrap up this webinar, um, I just have a number of our articles here on this slide. Uh, so the webinars were based on research done by the Center for Community-Based Research. I invite you to read these articles for more information on community-based evaluation. Thank you for participating in the Building Evaluation Capacity webinars. I hope this is the beginning of conversations to come around evaluation capacity. And this is just our final slide. If you do have any comments or questions, please feel free to send us a message at the following addresses on this slide. Thank you for your interest in community-based evaluation as a way of improving refugee serving programs. Bye for now.